What's up guys, Under here and now I'm back with another Survivor Series rebooking episode and this one is going to be Survivor Series 2005. Now on paper this might sound like a curious choice because most people probably think yeah, Survivor Series 2005 is pretty good, right? Doesn't really need a rebooking, right? Um, this definitely wasn't one of the bad Survivor Series or anything like that. But there's, there's a reason for me doing this one and it's pretty much because of what WWE's done for the last few years. So... Since 2016, Survivor Series has been all about brand supremacy, Raw vs SmackDown, and in, in this case this year, Raw vs SmackDown vs NXT, and to be honest, I think because of that, Survivor Series has regained its position as a result, because for a few years, I think Survivor Series had lost its luster, and it didn't really feel like a big four pay-per-view anymore, I would say. For about 2009 onwards, yeah, it just felt like a normal show. It didn't really feel special at all. And I feel like when WWE did the SmackDown vs. Raw in 2016, it made things just a hell of a lot better. And I'll probably say for the last three years, Survivor Series has probably been one of my favourite shows. And on paper, this year's Survivor Series looks pretty damn good as well. Um, so it got me thinking about Survivor Series, Raw vs. SmackDown. 2005, of course, was headlined by a Raw vs. SmackDown Survivor Series match 5 on 5. So that got me thinking, what if they did What if they did then what they do now? And that is have the entire card be Raw vs. SmackDown. I had a look for you, the 2005 rosters are pretty decent. I could probably put knock up a pretty good show with this one. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's run through what the real card was first before rebooking this bad boy. We had um, Chris Benoit versus Booker T in the Best of Seven United States Championship Series. For the WWE Women's Championship, Trish Stratus versus Melina. Triple H versus Ric Flair in a last man standing match. The G Battle of the GMs with um, Eric Bischoff versus Teddy Long. John Cena versus Kurt Angle for the WWE Championship. And Team Raw, which was Shawn Michaels, Big Show, Kane, Carlito, and Chris Masters. Versus Team Smackdown, which was Batista, Rey Mysterio, John Bradshaw, Layfield, Randy Orton and Bobby Lashley. So, with that out of the way, let's get to my rebooking. And just bear in mind, there's not really any storylines to these matches, like individual storylines to these matches. Um, we're just going to boot the Raw vs Smackdown brand supremacy, pretty much how it happened in real life. But that was actually a pretty good angle in 2005. Um, the brand split had been around for three years now, so I felt like a good time to uh, do that, to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, we're going to kick off with um, Booker T representing SmackDown versus Ric Flair representing Raw. So for the purposes of this, um, Booker T is a United States champion. The whole controversial thing of him and Chris Benoit hadn't happened yet. Um, they, they hadn't uh, vacated the US title yet. Um, so for my purposes, we, we could start the US title series immediately after this show. So Booker T's the yeah, United States champion. Ric Flair, of course, at the time was the Intercontinental champion. So I just thought it would be quite logical to do Booker US champion versus Ric Flair, the Intercontinental champion, because that's what they've done in real life for the last couple of years. Um, and it, it would be all right open. I'm not saying this would be a great match or anything like that, because Ric Flair in the 2000s, yeah, sometimes we would have some really good matches, especially with the right people, but certainly not regularly. And Booker T certainly probably wasn't the guy that was going to get a three and a half star four, four star match out of Ric Flair. This will probably be in the two and a half star, maybe three star range. Um, now we're going to let SmackDown get the victory to kick off the show. So SmackDown defeats Raw, Booker T defeats Ric Flair. Then we've got match number two. Trish Stratus versus Melina, so keep this the same because I was thinking have a women's match in the show, why not? But then you look at the, then then I was thinking, oh yeah, Melina was on SmackDown at the time, wasn't she? So I did kind of forget that Melina was already on SmackDown. This actually was a Raw versus SmackDown match in real life. Um so keep all that the same. Then you look at the SmackDown because roster at the time. Because at the time you only had one women's champion and that women's title was on the Raw brand. Um so on SmackDown, you didn't really have women's wrestlers on the show. It was mainly like uh, diva valet manager type things. Um, and Melina was easily the best choice to go with. Um, in the real life, this match was a decent match. And on this show, it'll probably be a decent match as well. So 
We'll have Trish Stratus go over to beat Molina to tie it up for the Raw brand. So it's now 1-1. One, one. Then we got got um, Bobby Lashley representing SmackDown face and Chris Masters representing Raw. So by that, you probably realise both of them aren't in the big Survivor Series match, which I'll explain a little bit more on later on. Um, because it, I, I, it takes certain people out to get certain people in other matches. Where well, for one particular reason, because one particular person in that match, I wanted in another match. So, I had totally re. I when I to- I had jig that Survivor Series match around a little bit. So, casual as that, where Chris Masters and Bobby Lashley will also have to be taken out. So I thought, oh, well, two big muscle guys would make sense for them to wrestle on the show, right? So this is back when Bobby Lashley was a rookie. Came to the WWE system probably about a year earlier, and just look at Bobby Lashley in the 2000s. This guy was a Vince McMahon wrestler, if I've ever seen one. Massive, hugely muscled, amateur wrestling background. Just looked like one of the baddest motherfuckers on the planet, and he was. I mean, there was a joke at the time that everyone used to call him Black Brock Lesnar, because um, at, at the time, Brock Lesnar with WWE were not on the best of terms. I think this was a time that. Brock was suing WWE to get, get that daft no compete clause revoked. So people, people joke that they, they had just had a black version of Brock Lesnar. Uh, lastly, he'd been on the SmackDown roster for a couple of months now. Was doing all right for himself. Um, feuding with Simon Dean, um, but it wasn't. But obviously, 2006 was quite a big year for him. Then 2007, he got the massive push of the ECW brand. Uh, represent. Represented Donald Trump in the Battle of the Billionaires matches, then left the WWE for still reasons that have never been fully explained in early 2008, and didn't come back to the company until 2018. And well, he's certainly in an interesting storyline now, isn't he? But we'll not go there. And then facing another guy who had pretty similar qualities, Chris Masters. That's a, that's a guy that's just. That another guy that was a Vincent Mann wrestler, if you've ever seen one. I mean, this guy was jacked to the gills. He keeps calling himself a masterpiece because you look at his physique. He had an incredible physique. He was a young guy as well. Uh, he just he had the look. He didn't really have that much charisma and was definitely green in the ring. But if you watch WWE for a certain period of time, you'll know that having a certain look will get you far, regardless of whether you're actually talented or not. I mean... It's always been that way, and to the extent it's always going to be that way. I mean, it's probably not as prominent now as it was then, but... A guy, say a guy walks into a dude that looks like a Bobby Lashley or a Chris Masters. You, you know Vince will want him on the main roster ASAP and give him a pretty good push. Um, so, putting these two guys together, how a two powerhouses going one-on-one would be... The match might not be might not be that, that great, but I think it would be an interesting story with them. Um, Two guys who are usually the strong guy in the match, fighting someone equal like equal power to them. Um, yeah, the match would be all right. I think it probably wouldn't be a great match, but a decent enough power power contest between two uh, big strong guys. And then we're going to have uh, Bobby Lashley go over to take, turn the tide back to Team SmackDown, and then. We're going to have an, int- an interest. We're not an interest. It'd be all right. It's just basically a good mid card match. Then we're going to have um, Shelton Benjamin representing Raw versus Matt Hardy versus SmackDown. I mean, purpose of this is just to put two good workers together and have a good wrestler match in the middle of the show. That makes sense to me. I mean, that, that seemed logical. I mean, at the time, Matt Hardy was back in the WWE after being fired. Uh, in the aftermath of the old Edge and later thing, then they had an on-screen feud of Edge, which resulted in Mahali leaving Raw, going to SmackDown. But he was, he was a good popular mid-card, and he was always a very reliable worker. And then Shelton Benjamin, one of the best workers of the time, in my opinion, really underrated guy. Never quite hit the height predicted of him, because when he came into Raw in 2004, had those matches with Triple H there. Uh, had a good one as the Intercontinental Champion. Looked really strong in the Money in the Bank match. Had that awesome match with Shawn Michaels on Raw and right after Backlash in the Gold Rush tournament. And yeah, he just never really kicked on. WWE never really pushed him to the heights that a lot of people predicted of him. 
I think he could have been at least a world heavyweight champion, maybe. I don't know if he could have been WWE champion enough because I think the thing that held him back is his promo skills were limited. He wasn't terrible on the microphone, <clears throat> but he wasn't really good at either at the same time, you know. Um, but really good workout, really good upper mid card work at the time. And yeah, this is probably give these like 10 12 minutes, I'll probably have a three and a quarter star match or something like that. This probably won't blow it away, but it'll, it'll do his job as a good wrestler match in the middle of the card. Then we're going to have Shelton Benjamin go over to make a 2 2 in favour of Raw. Now we've got three big matches now. These are the three big matches on the show. Um, and one I really think would be great in that. Um, Next one, Triple H representing Raw versus, versus The Undertaker representing SmackDown. So I've sacrificed that angle at the end of The Undertaker coming back out of the flame and coffin to beat the crap out of Randy Orton and SmackDown. I mean, I'm, I'm, that was a great angle, but I really wanted to get have this match on the show. Undertaker was not injured at the time, so he's on this show. So obviously I'm for, there's no edge on this show because he was injured at the time. Mr. Kennedy not on the show, injured at the time. And for obvious reasons, Eddie Guerrero not on the show at the time because he was dead. So, um, and this is probably a match I really wanted to boo. Now, because I'm a dumbass and I forget things sometimes, I originally had Triple H versus Kurt Angle on the show, but I'm thinking, oh shit, yeah, Kurt Angle was on Raw at the time, wasn't he? Because it's kind of forgettable sometimes Kurt Angle was even on Raw. Because he was on Raw for like six months. Went back to SmackDown in early 2006, so sometimes you kind of forget he was even on Raw in 2005, and which I know is quite strange because he was in um, feud with John Cena for months. Then I thought, oh, Undertaker, yeah, that's right. Because um, at the time, between 2001 and 2011, Triple H and Undertaker did have many matches. Uh, it was very rare to see them in a singles match because Undertaker went over SmackDown in 2002. Triple H was the man on Raw, and Undertaker was that that, that legend that was on SmackDown. He wasn't necessarily the guy on SmackDown, but he was that legend that gave the brand credibility. So, probably, yeah, I'd probably say they were probably the two. I, I guess you could say Cena and Batista, but as far as legendary status, Triple H and Undertaker were probably the top two guys in either brand. So it makes sense, and they didn't wrestle a whole lot in between. In between 01 and 11, so like, it's be a nice opportunity to have the match happen. I mean, I used to always, when I used to fantasy book back then, I used to always um, think of ways to do Triple H versus The Undertaker. I mean, I'm sure this would be a damn good match. Probably not a classic match. Probably not on the level of the two of the WrestleMania 27 and 28 matches, but probably about as good as the WrestleMania 17 match, I would say, because. 2005, Triple H had a pretty good year in the ring in 2005, Undertaker could still go with the right guy, because in the 0, 0, 2, 0, no, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0, 6, dude really had a tendency to start putting Undertaker with youth as big men, but when he wrestled someone like a Kurt Angle or a Randy Orton, he usually had a damn good match, and this would be a pretty good match too, give him like 20 minutes, 18 minutes, someone like that, let them do the thing, and then we're going to have Triple H defeat the Undertaker, uh, I think a lot of people would have the Undertaker go over, but I've decided to put Triple H over, because why the hell not? Um, so Triple H goes over, then Raw gets the advantage. Now we're going to have a... Now the big Survivor Series match, Team Raw versus Team SmackDown. So Team... And what I've done with this one, because... Well, you'll see in a minute, but obviously when I, when I don't mention one guy, you'll probably work out what the main event of the show is going to be. So I uh, take someone out of the match... Um, and then, because I looked at the smack, cause I'll, just see, I'll just see what it is. So, it's a four versus four, not five versus five. So, we're going to have Team Raw, which is Shawn Michaels, Kurt Angle, Kane and the Big Show. The first Team Smackdown, which is Randy Orton, JBL, Rey Mysterio and Chris Benoit. So, I took Batista out for a purpose. You'll probably already realise what that purpose is. Uh, I looked at the SmackDown roster, so obviously direct replacement, uh, put Batista in with uh, Chris Benoit, and then then uh, to do that I took, because um, I thought uh, I wanted a, I didn't have a match with Kurt Angle basically, so I had to put Kurt Angle in the Raw team, so I took Carlito and Chris Masters out to make a good four-man team, 
Um, and yeah, so I've kept it four versus four. Uh, to be honest, um, yeah, this be this be a good match. I mean, it was a really good match in real life, so I don't think it'd be that much different here. Obviously, the storyline and the build up of this show pretty much the same, but obviously you modify it a little bit to compensate for the mass changes on this one. And um, so let's go. We will have them. Um, we can have. Chris Benoit be the first man eliminated with a double choke slam by Kane and the Big Show. Then we can have um, the Big Show be eliminated by doing all these triple team moves. All these triple team moves. So you can, you, I, think, I think they did this in real life. Uh, JBL hit the close line. Hell, Ray hit a 619. Then Randy Orton hit the RKO. So the Big Show could be eliminated. Then it's three on three. Then uh, Kane could be the next man eliminated. So... Uh, Maybe Randy Orton can eliminate Kane, so then it's three on two. And then you can have then you can have Kurt Angle be the next one eliminated. You could have a maybe JBL hit a close line from hell on Kurt Angle. So in real life they had Shawn Michaels hit three on one odds. Uh, pretty much a throw back to 2003. They did the same thing. So I'm gonna do that one here. Then we can have a so yeah, make it the same. Sean can eliminate Mysterio do a with a uh, super kick in midair, then he can eliminate JBL. Then it'd be down to Michaels and Orton, just like it was in 2003, and this is how it was in real life there as well. Then you can have Orton eliminate Shawn Michaels, so Team SmackDown win the uh, Survivor Series match as in real life. So then it's free all. Then because I have had the take on the card, I did have to unfortunately sacrifice um, the great post match angle where the Undertaker returned on the show. And beat up most of the SmackDown roster and attack Randy Orton. Uh, I know it's a shit. Yeah, I, I can see why people might complain if I do that, but I just think it's a sacrifice that needs to be done. Um, so this would be a good match. So now we're going to free all, going to the final, because that just makes sense, right? I mean, there's no point in having a Raw versus SmackDown match if um, one brand already run won by the time the main event comes around. I mean, do you remember last year when Raw Raw in every single match? So by the time the last Raw vs Smackdown match came around, did it really matter because the result really didn't matter in the end? But it just makes logical sense when you do brand versus brand shows or fantasy book inter-promotional shows that by the time the final match runs around, the main event will be all to play for. And of course, you probably worked it out. The main event for Survivor Series 2005, WWE Champion John Cena but representing Raw vs the World Heavyweight Champion Batista Representing SmackDown, I mean, this seems logical, right? I mean, the last few Survivor Series, we had Brock Lesnar, Universal Champion vs AJ Styles, WWE Champion. And last year, it was Brock Lesnar, Universal Champion vs Daniel Bryan, WWE Champion. So why wouldn't you do the same thing here? I mean, if you did book an entire Raw vs SmackDown pay-per-view, I, mean, I think most people would say the logical main event would be the Battle of the World Champions, right? And at this one, at the time, you had um, the WWE. 2005 WWE went all in and made Batista and John Cena the new guy. So, obviously, the Attitude Era had been gone for a while. The Rock and Austin were long gone from the company, never coming back. The guy that they pinned the Hawks on, Brock Lesnar, abruptly left the WWE in 2004. So, kind of left WWE without some top stars. I mean, you had Triple H around, but I think WWE needed to create new stars for a brand new era of wrestling. And John Cena and Batista were the guys. I mean, Batista got over hugely when he was uh, teasing the feud of Triple H in late 2004 into early 2005. I mean, you, you probably can't kind of forget how quickly Batista got over. Because look back at Survivor Series 2004, Batista was just the other guy in evolution. And then there was one night in Raw where they teased Triple H and Batista turn on each other. And the fans got so behind Batista. And this also coincided with the fact that they botched the Orton face turn earlier in the year. Because at the time, it looked, it looked like it was probably going to be Triple H versus Randy Orton at WrestleMania 21. But they fucked that up. And then Batista kind of became a backup plan. But he, came, he was a hell of a backup plan. He got, like in late 04, early 05, he just suddenly got so over. I mean, there was just something so likeable about him when fans just really took to him. Then, of course, he turned on Triple H in a memorable angle the night after No Way Out 2005. And then, very memorably, 
when on a big trip later on three consecutive pay-per-views, WrestleMania 21, Backlash 2005, and Hell in a Cell, Avengers 2005, so... That's how, you, that's how you make a star. You've got a main events guy in Triple H, and then he puts this guy Batista over three separate times, no 50-50 nonsense, then all of a sudden Batista's seen as a big main event star. Amazing, right? Um, and also at the same time, John Cena was getting over on SmackDown. I mean, I think from like all three, early or four, he was pretty obvious he wanted John Cena to be a top guy. Um, and I think he was going to get there eventually, but I think I think like Brock Lesnar leaving the company definitely sped up the process process of Cena becoming the guy. So Cena gets a nice strong push throughout 2004, 2005 comes around. Uh, JBL is a WWE champion. He's beating everybody. Then he uh, faces this young upstart named John Cena at WrestleMania 21. John Cena wins the WWE title that night, and they're kind of off to the race with Cena and Batista. And then they, then they made a curious decision. And I guess in WWE's mind, they thought, well, which one of them? We've got these two guys that could be our face of the company. So which one of them would, are we going to go with? And I guess the thinker was, John Cena's got more charisma. There's more long-term value in John Cena because at the time, even then, Batista was like 36 when he won the world title because Batista started wrestling quite late in his very late 20s, early 30s. And John Cena was 27 at the time. So I guess the feeling was, well, I think John Cena is going to be the more, most logical uh, long-term push, and they were right because they got they got like a full decade out of John Cena being the guy. So in June two thousand and five, the draft, John Cena goes to Raw with the WWE title, and then Batista switches over to SmackDown with the World Heavyweight title. And for me at the time, I always thought like uh, Cena and Batista were pretty much neck and neck at the time in two thousand and five. I mean, don't get me wrong, Cena passed Batista later on. But I think in 2005, I always saw it as one and one here. They were kind of on equal footing. And then I feel like with Batista getting injured in uh, early 2006, releasing the world title. And then Cena going on to main event WrestleMania with Triple H and they have that epic feud of Edge. I think by the time uh, Batista came back, Cena has cemented himself as the guy. So, And I remember, I think for years we always... Um, Fantasy book John Cena versus Batista one on one. Thought this obviously this this feud writes itself. The top two top guys in the company, top two top homegrown stars in the Attitude Era, um, and it didn't happen until SummerSlam 2008. But I feel like it would happen here. I mean, as a match, would this match be probably great? Not really, because at the time Cena still was uh, so so in the ring. He wasn't having good matches all the time. And Batista was always limited in the ring, especially in this period. So it was an actual, quote-unquote, technical wrestling five-star classic. It wouldn't be that. But to be fair, I think it'd be entertaining. I think the crowd would be really into it. I mean, it's obvious that Batista would be the fan favourite in this one because this was right around the time the fans were really starting to turn on Cena. I mean, there was whispers of it. As soon as he got turned, went to Raw, really, then I think the more first noticeable one was he wrestled Chris Jericho at SummerSlam. There was quite a lot of boos there. And even in his feud of Kurt Angle... A decent amount of booze there as well. Um, and obviously, Boo and Cena became a big thing for the next, next decade when all of a sudden people decided they liked, they, just, they hated Rowan Reigns even more and then started cheering Cena, but we'll not get into that one. So for me, give these about 15 minutes. With the guys not being the best, work, this doesn't need to be a 25, 30 minute main event. 15 minutes would be perfectly fine for me. Let them do lay the match out well, let them do the big moves and all that. Uh, big power moves and then we can have a uh, we'll have John Cena go over to Batista hitting the second FU after Batista kicks out one FU and then John Cena wins and because obviously at the time John Cena was um, being grew to be the guy over Batista so it makes sense to have John Cena go over Batista so the Raw brand wins 4-3 to three. I know Smackdown won the war in real life but I think at the time Raw was a, the biggest show in stature and the better show in quality, in my opinion. From 04 to 05, it was definitely raw, so it makes sense to have the raw brand go over. So that's a wrap, guys. Not sure if I'll do any more reboots for Survivor Series, because obviously Survivor Series is this week, and then we're going to December next month, so I probably won't for, for now anyway. I think I've done four, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and, and obviously, uh, we're going to do a uh, 
Survivor Series uh, TakeOver War Games reveals coming up. And until next time, guys, peace.